Hi everyone, I'm Kathy Lenatra, State Representative of the 12th Plymouth District. I represent the towns of Kingston, Plimpton, Halifax, parts of Plymouth, Duxbury, and Middleborough. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Profiles, where we highlight the people, programs, and events that make our district so special. I hope you enjoy these stories as much as I do. On today's show, we will be joined by Amy Belmore of Kingston. Amy is the Director of Development and Outreach at Habitat for Humanity of Greater Plymouth. She has been in this role for almost three years, and prior to joining Habitat, she spent over 20 years working locally in nonprofit management and in higher education in Boston. She is a lifelong resident of Kingston, and I'm lucky to call Amy one of my very best friends. Amy, it's great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Of course. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. All oh, of us here at Habitat do. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, Habitat's very close to my heart as well. I love what you do there, um, and I'm very proud of you for what you do there. So we're going to get right into it. And a lot of people have heard of Habitat for Humanity, but really don't understand what you do. So can you just tell us about like some of the projects you've completed recently? Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. Not everybody understands all that Habitat actually does. And so our mission here is to make sure, to do our best to make sure that people, everyone has a decent place to live, really. And to do that by providing affordable housing ownership opportunities in our service area. Our service area, Habitat of Greater Plymouth, includes the towns of Plymouth, Carver, Kingston, Lakeville, Middleborough, and Plimpton. And Habitat is known, probably most well known for building houses from start to finish, right? From the foundation right up to handing over the keys for the homeowners who are either low to moderate income qualified families. Um, and so we build those homes start to finish with volunteer labor. And that's really what, what Habitat for Humanity is most well known for. At the same time, we also provide critical home repairs to existing houses for whether it be weatherization or wheelchair ramp installation or issues in homes for low income families or individuals who, you know, there's a real issue for safety and health in the home that needs to be addressed and we'll step in and do that type of work. That's called our Brush With Kindness program and not as many people know about that. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I was going to bring that up right now, but that is true. Not many people know about that. They just think of when I, before I knew actually what it all was for Habitat Humanity, you think you get volunteers, they go in, they bang a few nails someday and feel good about themselves and go. But it's so much more than that. Um, can you tell us like what's in the pipeline now? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we just kind of came through one of our busiest periods of construction and productivity. So you would remember well back in 2020, at the very, very uh, beginning of 2020, you were kind enough to join us as we were dedicating a house in Kingston that we had just finished. And just for, a, I'll take just kind of a segue for a minute. I, it still strikes me so much that we dedicated that house in um, January of 2020. And our homeowners are still mortgage holders. They're paying an affordable mortgage. The houses are not gifted. These houses are um, in their, their affordable houses in perpetuity, but the homeowners are paying mortgages. So we, we dedicated that house, but you were there to celebrate and mark with us and meet the family. And that was great. Thank you for, for coming out and being part of that. And then we went through the closing process and that family, a father, and two sons, two young sons, mm -hmm. and his mom, who is a caretaker to the boys, moved in at the very beginning of March of 2020, like 10 days before the world turned upside down. And we all came to understand the importance of a home being a safe zone. Mm -hmm. And so that, that just always strikes me yes. that that family that we served back then was able to move into their own space when they had been bouncing around from couch to couch and shelters and so forth. and in early March, they had their own home as we worked our way through COVID and here we are today. Um, but in addition to that, we built three homes in Plymouth uh, on Long Pond Road. They're side by side. Two of them were dedicated to veterans 
And of course we had to pause that work during COVID because of the restrictions of group gathering sizes and volunteers working together, but we got back at it when we were able and we completed those houses um, at the very end of 20, uh, at the very end of 2020. And so the families all moved in, all three moved in in early of 2021. They've not just now celebrated their first holiday season in those houses and they're settling in and they're doing great in there. Um, you know, their whole worlds are different now. They've really had some transformational opportunities of having, living in an affordable, secure, stable home for themselves and their children. So we just went through all of that. And now we're in, we have a few projects in the pipeline. Um, one, we're having some really great conversations with um, town officials over in Carver for an abandoned home or a abandoned property over in Carver that we're hoping to acquire. Uh, that'll involve me, uh, vote of town meeting and that kind of thing, but we're working with some great advocates and officials over there, and that is likely to become our next project. Um, it's a beautiful old home, but the entire inside, the entire interior needs to be rehabbed, and that, you know, we'll be taking that on and uh, very likely will become, because we are working with veterans advocates from the town of Carver on this project as well, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that likely will become a veteran homeowner. And then in addition to that, I did just wanna mention where I had talked previously about the Brush With Kindness program. We are in the, starting in the month of February, we're gonna be taking on a major renovation for a family in Plymouth, um, really difficult circumstances that they've been going through. Um, their teenage uh, granddaughter, this, this young woman lives with her grandparents in Plymouth. She had a severe, reaction, a toxic reaction to medication that she was given. And she developed um, what's called Stevens-Johnson syndrome. And it, it, it completely uh, just destroyed her eyesight. She's, mm -hmm. she's legally blind now. It's affected her. Uh, she has nerve damage. She has mobility challenges. She had to go through an incredible um, rounds of treatment to deal with the the burning that was happening both inside and outside oh, her body. Tragic, it's a really tragic, tragic story, mm. but um, she's doing a little bit better now. And that home needs a lot of renovation to, so that she can live on the first floor rather than the second floor. So we'll be putting on an addition. We'll be reconfiguring the first floor of that house, making a, a bathroom that's uh, handicap accessible for her, putting on an exterior ramp and walkway so she doesn't have to be carried up and down the stairs um so that's our next big project that's going to be that's starting a wonderful uh, project imminently, really yeah imminently. wonderful project yeah. i just want to back up before because i don't know if a lot of people know this but when you say that house is affordable in perpetuity right so we're yes. talking about a deed restriction is that on the yes. deed so um do you want to explain to our viewers what that actually means because a lot of people yeah. don't understand so, what that means. Absolutely. So we are exactly. So the houses are do carry a deed restriction so that they'll always be um, considered affordable housing inventory within those towns. And so that our homeowners, they are able to. We've never in our experience, we've never had homeowners that have actually sold their homes because quite simply, and you would know better than most, Kathy, as a realtor yourself, how outrageous Right. Uh, the housing market is it's crazy um, unless they were to fall into an incredibly you know prosperous situation or had a, had a major life change they wouldn't be able to sell their home and turn around and buy something else in southeastern Massachusetts or really right. anywhere in Massachusetts and so we've never had the situation with our affiliate where where a homeowner has gone ahead and tried to sell it but if they did they would be able to take the equity value um, out of their home that they put into it. As I mentioned, they are mm -hmm. paying an affordable mortgage, um, but they can't flip the house. They can't right. come into the house, flip it and turn around and sell it, you know, at fair market value and, and make a lot of money on a Habitat home. Right. So in that paves the way when that does happen, if it does happen, it paves the way for another family to move into an affordable unit. So it's oh, carried sure, forward, sure. right? If so that that's were a great to thing. So yes, it's it carried stay, forward. Right. That house will always stay as an affordable home, which is very beneficial to, our, you know, as I say all the time, our, our people just starting out and, you know, our teachers, our firefighters, our police officers, all just starting out. Um, that's, we have such a high need for affordable housing to begin with. 
Um, so let's talk about the families. That, I mean, you mentioned, touch on some of the families. I've met one of them. Um, how they feel, you know, like you said, they went through the first holiday season. Can you imagine, like, going from place to place to place, and you're you're with your whole family, you feel secure, and you have Christmas, or you celebrate whatever holiday you celebrate, or Thanksgiving, and do they do they reach out to you and tell you how it feels? Yeah, they do. And we stay in touch with them um, as well. You know, our, our executive director, Jim Middleton, who I know you know, yes. Kathy, um, you know, visits, especially down on Long Pond Road. And we stay we stay in touch with many of our families. Um, I mean, we do in a, on a general, from a business mm -hmm. perspective, we need to stay in touch with them. But we also just want to check in and see how they're doing. And we did hear, we got a nice picture from one of the veterans who, these one of the three most recent homes that I mentioned before, she sent us a picture of her um, family and, and friend that had joined her at Thanksgiving and the, and the meal that was set out on their table. And, and she clearly was proud to, to have that opportunity. And, and, you know, another house, they sent us pictures all lit up, you know, the big lights all around the trim and on the, you know, snowmen in the yard and that kind of thing. <laughs> all of these houses have children, um, many of them young children. And so they are definitely finding um, the, just the freedom and the, the ability to feel secure and safe in their own yards, in their own homes, um, and to have that joy that should yeah. come with any childhood, yeah. but to not have the stress and the burden of, um, you know, being overcrowded or mm -hmm. in an unsafe situation. We, we've had, you know, we've had a family with a, you know, a child that was, you know, they had real concerns. They were living right near a cliffside and they were worried that he might wander off and, um, and hurt himself, and and now they're in a completely different environment that that's really safe and secure for them. It so it is transformational yeah. change without question. In addition to that kind of peace of mind, mm -hmm. which is huge, you know, there are statistics, many studies that show that secure housing will improve children's learning, um, improve their chances of either, you know, attending higher education or getting into some sort of vocational training. You know, their social connections are stronger and better. They can invite friends over. They can feel comfortable as they learn and as they grow. And then for parents, you know, just not having the stress of right. not being able to pay your rent or, right. um, you know, keep a, a roof over your family's heads that, you know, that's just better for them from their physical health, their mental health, can help with job productivity and mm -hmm. job growth. There are so many effects that come from having a secure affordable home. Yeah, uh, it, it's so true. I met with um, a professor, actually it was the president of a, um, a junior college, and I can't remember which junior college it was, it was out west, and we were talking about their students in home insecurity and, and the correlation of being home insecure and how well they do in school and how they support those students. So you're right, it, it, it takes so many forms when you're secure in your home, how it really changes your life um, and that of your family. And one of the best stories I remember and the best feelings I felt is when we went to that house in Kingston when we did the ribbon cutting that the, the neighborhood came together and bought that little boy a bike. Do you remember that? Yeah. That was the sweetest thing. Yep. He, all the kids from wonderful. the neighborhood were there and presented him with a bike. So he not only got a new bike, but he had a whole new set of friends right away yeah so that was very it yeah. was a very good feeling um and i know they're doing well too i know they're doing well so that's great to see yeah. but as you know like going yeah, through covid know, he has a stable job and and the kids yeah. are thriving and they're doing great um, you know when we've heard from other volunteers is you know our, our long time people uh, volunteers our construction supervisor has been with um you know our affiliate for a very long time and has seen children and been stayed in touch with these families that that we've served and you know, he talks about seeing how their confidence grows over time and just how they, they really kind of come into their own when they feel like they have that stability. And you know, another volunteer who actually got involved with Habitat because she had been a teacher in a classroom and taught, you know, and, and she had a child who was a Habitat kid. Um, and she saw how he changed over the course of a year or two. And that's what inspired her to get involved. This was years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I mean, these are real, they're not, it's not, merely anecdotal we have right. kind of that real world experience of knowing that this is making a difference not just for the children but for for the parents as well oh, and it's awesome definitely it's awesome. it is it's great but let's talk about the volunteers because you brought up the volunteers so I know many of the volunteers 
And I mean, we have to mention Den Forbes, right? Um, Sean yeah. Normandy. I mean, yeah. there's so many, there's so many. Uh, and how they got involved. And, and if you wanted to get involved, how would you get involved? Because I'm sure that COVID has really impacted, as I know you do a lot of fundraising, has probably really impacted that. So how were you staying afloat during COVID? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so the, in terms of the volunteers, we have, you know, we were, when we were in the throes of COVID and we weren't able to kind of get together and work in the, in the ways that we typically did, um, once, once we were able to continue bringing volunteers together, you know, we followed all of the social distancing and masking, and we still follow all of the advisories that are issued now and very careful in that regard. But it, you know, many of our volunteers are retirees. Um, they want to give back. They, you know, they have the extra time, not all of them, but many of them are. And so COVID had a, an impact on, on them because, mm -hmm. you know, they felt like they needed to protect their own, um, health they had uh, different considerations to to take into account um so it is something that we you know we're constantly out there and, and uh, asking folks to get involved and to help whether you have any construction experience whatsoever it does not matter you are trained on everything that you need to know when we are in the throes of a building project like like that uh, mm -hmm. renovation that i talked about down in plymouth for the young teenager um you know, we're going to need a lot of volunteers for that and people can absolutely get involved. But in addition, we have other non-construction volunteer opportunities too. And we have a whole host of volunteers who help on committees, whether it's fundraising, you're mm -hmm. right, we have been yeah. impacted. We, we've had to really change, you know, our in-person fundraising. We've done some virtual events and we've tried to get creative, but we have volunteers who help with that. We have volunteers who help with site selection and looking for land because we're always on the hunt for land for new projects. Um, here in the ReStore, I do want to mention the ReStore yes, as well. I was going to bring that up, the ReStore, which yeah. I frequent quite frequently, right? You have to be there every day because new stuff comes in every day. And that table, I yeah. wanted that table, but that man was not letting it go. <laughs> he wasn't. That no, day you he, were here, was he was like, was it's really, mine. Yeah, I couldn't even ask the question. He kept saying, it's mine, it's mine. But there's some great things. No, you things. missed out by just moments on that one. But <laughs> yeah, for those who don't know what the ReStore is, and actually, I, as I as I make my way around in the community and and go to you know different um, events and and outreach things, I you know I'm still surprised that there are a lot of people who don't know what the ReStore is. And um, so the ReStore is a social enterprise model that Habitat you know across the country follows. Mm -hmm. Not every affiliate has a ReStore. Um, we opened ours 15, almost 15 years ago. We're coming wow. up on our 15th anniversary. And basically it's a, it's a store that accepts um, gently used furniture and, and building materials, doors, windows, tons of lighting, cabinets, mm -hmm. um, lots of furniture. And we turn around and, and sell that at deep discounts to the public. A lot of people think that you might need to be low income to, to no. shop here. No. Not at all true. No. We always like to break that, that myth. Yeah. Um, people anybody can shop here and anybody can donate here and all of the proceeds from the restore are, turn, are turned around and support the mission of building affordable houses and so it's really we're right here in carver we're right on the plimpton carver line on route 58 and um, we welcome people to come in stop by you're right the inventory changes all the time mm -hmm. stuff flies in and out of here because it it's such great deals and it's really good quality stuff so it's great quality um, stuff really i want to bring that up because a lot of people that are moving you know as i see a lot of people moving have these big china cabinets or these big dining room sets and they want to donate that but you don't accept everything right you only accept oh yeah There's some really great stuff and it, unfortunately the trend right here now no one wants those big china cabinets anymore we find right that is those true. big dining room sets. They yeah, want that, that is round true. white table yeah, that he, was in your store. That's what they want. <laughs> That's what I wanted. <laughs> that white table. That was, that was trendy. That was definitely that was trendy. trendy. It was great. So, but it's you know, really it's just really important quality that, um, you know, we do everything that we can to to support that mission. You know, um, and you could probably I could go to school on all the details that you could tell me, Kathy, but you know, in Massachusetts, one in seven households spend more than half of their income on housing. More right. than half. Yeah, and half. for people in the low income cat, the extremely low income category, meaning like they earn less than thirty percent of the area median income, right. they're paying fifty eight percent of their income on housing, rent, mm -hmm. you know, um, housing expenses, leaving very little for other necessities like food and healthcare and and if there was an emergency, and, there's nothing. 
right? You know, in an emergency right. for for us, maybe I'm trying to think of an example, but so I'll put it the other way. Like a flat tire for us would be an inconvenience. For some of us would just be an inconvenience. A flat tire for somebody that's paying that amount in rent, that, that affects their entire life. That affects their ability to go to work, ability to bring their children to the doctor. So, you know, it's, it's crazy what rents are, crazy. Right. Right. And, you know, and then I was, this is a statistic from 2020. I don't know where we're at right now in 2021, but I know at that time it was like, we had Massachusetts was down like 160,000 affordable housing units, mm -hmm. you know, that would be needed to meet mm -hmm. the, that would be required to meet the need. And even yesterday I was reading a report that um, in, in the South shore across, not, not necessarily affordable housing, but housing inventory as a whole yeah. is like 10% compared to 10 years ago. Um, so that's just availability of any type of housing, that's never right. mind the fact that we have such a void of affordable housing. Right. And so that's just something that we're really trying to address. We're in good conversations where we have a, um, an individual who's interested in donating some land to us over in Middleborough. So we're in a conversation with him about that. We're getting some engineering work done to see if that, how you know, how viable that can be and what, how many units we can, we can potentially build over there. And then we're having some really good conversations with town officials and positive dialogue in Plimpton. So, you know, every day we're working on how we can make an impact on increasing the opportunities for people to have home ownership opportunities that, that are truly affordable for their families. And when we talk about affordable, um, you know, we have that NIMBY attitude, not in my backyard, because yeah. they assume affordable housing is um, apartments or high rises or, or what, you know, it used to be like in Boston, the projects they used to call them or, you know, something like that. And that is not the case. That is not the case. No. Affordable housing are, 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 are homes that we grew up in, right? We don't have affordable neighborhoods. I grew up in a neighborhood in Kingston, uh, not in Kingston, I'm sorry, in Hanover, where they were all split level ranches. And that was like, you know, your starter homes. We don't have those neighborhoods anymore. Um, so it puts a lot of people out of the, the, the market for a home. Like you said, it, there's such a lack of homes. I think in Kingston alone right now, there's only five actual homes for sale at this moment where wow. five years ago, there would probably be 53. Right. Yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah. So that's, that's amazing. And, and one of the other things, and I know, you know, uh, seniors and, and making sure that our elders are, are taken care of is really important to you and as it is to us as well. Mm -hmm. And so we typically over the, you know, we've built 14 houses over the years and we've, they've all been, um, we've had families move in, families with children. And it is the habitat model that every, every house, if, if there are three bedrooms in the house, which is typical for us, we mm -hmm. build three bedroom homes that every bedroom be filled. We don't build houses to have an extra room, right? right? That's like right. within the habitat guidelines that we create. But we're actually having some conversations about, you know, building smaller homes, smaller footprints for yeah. seniors who need to downsize, that want to downsize. We know how important it is that it they is. stay within their community mm -hmm. if they want to do so, or they had a lifelong experience and yeah. built their relationships and maybe they're widowed or they're on their own and they need the support of their network, but they have nowhere to go. And right. so in some cases, those folks are are really tying up a family home, a home that could support a family exactly. when they don't even yes. need that amount of space mm -hmm. because they simply have nowhere to go that they right. can afford. And so that's something that we're looking at that that would be a, a little bit of a, a shift for us. But it's, it's, an, it's an exciting one to think about. In it is my exciting. Mind, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. I'd love friend. to be involved in that. Yeah. Um, you're right. They are, and they can't maintain those homes or the taxes. And oh my gosh, I could talk to you forever on that. You know that. Um, but before, because we're running out of time. So can we talk about how people can help? How can people help yes. Habitat? Absolutely. So um, they can, as I mentioned, they can volunteer, whether it's on a construction crew, providing lunch for folks here at the ReStore, they could donate to the ReStore, they could shop at the ReStore. So many opportunities they can discover on our on our website, which is simply hfhplymouth.org. And if you go there, you can see all the different um, buttons and ways in which they can help. Of course, we accept donations and we encourage them and we need financial support to make our operation work and to build these homes. And so you'll see that donate button there as well. 
Um, you know, and, and we're hoping to do our gala, our 25th anniversary gala in October, COVID pending, but we're, we're hopeful um, that we'll be able to stay on track with that. But there are lots of opportunities and certainly, um, you know, they could always call our office as well and we can talk folks through. But I would say restore, shop, donate, donate financially and volunteer your time or your skill or your is skill. amazing. Thank you, Amy. That was amazing. I'm so glad you could come on today and explain everything about Habitat for Humanity. And I cannot wait for that gala as well in October. Um, there's some great auction items. And even if you wanted to donate an auction item, correct? Yeah. yeah oh, yes, absolutely. Thank like you for bringing Like a trip to that Ireland, yes. maybe? That would be fantastic. But thank you for yep. taking time out of your day today to meet with us thank and discuss you. Habitat for Humanity. Thank you so much for the chance. I really appreciate it. And we'll see you soon. Thanks, Amy. We will be right back Bye. with our State House Minute. <music> On each episode of Profiles, I like to take a minute to take my constituents out of the 12th Plymouth District and provide a quick update of what is going on up at Beacon Hill. On January 18th, the Massachusetts House of Representatives passed a $55 million COVID response bill aimed at addressing the current shortcomings and in dealing with the latest outbreak of COVID-19. The legislation, which will draw from the state's general fund, provides $30 million to create and expand COVID testing sites. We have heard from so many folks about the struggles in finding a test. These funds will go a long way towards helping more people access COVID tests quickly. The bill also provides $5 million to expand youth vaccination rates, with more money focused on communities disproportionately affected by the virus. The final $25 million will go towards purchasing and distributing high-quality masks to students and faculty in elementary and secondary education across the Commonwealth. I was happy to support this important piece of legislation, along with all of my colleagues in the House. The bill will now move to the Senate for consideration and will go to the governor's desk after the Senate. I want to thank Amy for joining us today and for her extraordinary work in helping so many folks across the South Shore find long-term housing. The current housing crisis is one that will require a lot of attention to solve, and I greatly appreciate the work Amy and Habitat for Humanity of Greater Plymouth are doing to solve this crisis. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join us next month for Profiles with myself, Kathy Lenatra.